It had been 400 years since God had spoken directly to the Israelites. Then, one day, God sent an angel to a girl named Mary, who was engaged to a man named Joseph. The angel told Mary that she would soon become pregnant and give birth to a son named Jesus. God would give him the throne of his ancestor David, and his kingdom would never end. But Mary was a virgin, and this confused her. So the angel told her it would be by God's power that she became pregnant. When Mary's fiance Joseph heard about this, he decided he would quietly end the engagement. But an angel visited Joseph as well, telling him not to be afraid, and that Jesus would save people from their sins. So Joseph and Mary decided to get married. Soon after, they traveled to the town of Bethlehem. Because so many other people were in town, there was no place for them to stay. While they were there, Mary gave birth to her son, wrapped him in cloths, and laid him in the manger. There were shepherds living in the fields nearby. While they were watching their sheep, an angel appeared to them announcing that a boy had been born in Bethlehem. This boy, said the angel, was the Messiah, the king that the Israelites had been waiting for. So the shepherds left their sheep and raced to Bethlehem, finding Mary and Joseph and Jesus. The shepherds praised God for their new king. During this time, the country of Rome controlled all of Israel. After hearing about Jesus' birth, a group of magicians and astrologers came to Herod, a governor working for the Roman Empire. They claimed that they had seen a star in the sky, telling them that the king of the Israelites, now called Jews, had been born. This news really upset Herod. When they arrived in Bethlehem and met Mary, Joseph, and Jesus, they felt great joy. Herod was furious and commanded that all boys in Bethlehem who were two years old and younger, be killed. But God had already warned Joseph, who by that time had moved his family to Egypt to hide. Later, after King Herod died, Joseph, Mary, and Jesus moved back to Israel, to a small town named Nazareth. They stayed in Nazareth for years, raising Jesus. When he was 12, they traveled to Jerusalem for a festival. When the festival ended, Joseph and Mary left for home with a large group of people, but Jesus stayed behind without them knowing. When they realized he was missing, they went back to Jerusalem and found Jesus sitting in the temple, listening to the teachers and asking them questions. His parents were upset and couldn't understand why he had stayed behind. Jesus told them, didn't you know I had to be in my father's house? Joseph and Mary didn't know what he meant. They did not yet fully understand the importance of who Jesus was and all he would do. Let's go to our Lord in prayer. Heavenly Father, after centuries of waiting, you answered the words of the prophets. You sent Jesus as Savior to this world. And Lord, that's something we continue to celebrate now, even as we begin the season of Lent, a time of looking to you, a time of returning our hearts and minds to you. Lord, as we walk through this journey of Lent, help us see that without the birth of Jesus, none of this would have happened, and that we can rejoice every day that you loved us enough to send Jesus to be our Lord and Savior a Savior who would go all the way to a cross to give his life for us. We thank you for that blessing in Jesus' name. Amen. Brothers, sisters in Christ, we have now been walking through the Old Testament and the story since the school year started, believe it or not. And I will say I am very proud of this congregation. I'll admit when we started this 32-week-long series, I wondered if everyone was going to buy into this. How many people in our church family would commit to reading through the Old and New Testaments over a 32-week period? And I want to share with you, it's been a joy for me to see us work together, be it in Bible class, the things that are being sent out, and just walking through the Old Testament and now the New Testament together as one. 
Well, today is a big transition Sunday. Today we go from the Old Testament, which we have spent those 21 weeks looking at, into a little more familiar territory, the New Testament. Now, one thing I think we've learned as we walk through the Old Testament is that God does not act randomly, haphazardly, or in coincidence. In fact, all the way from the beginning of time, back in the Garden of Eden, God was preparing the way for the entrance of His Son, Jesus, into a broken world. As we worked our way through the Old Testament, we heard stories of the people of old who are just like us today. No matter how hard they try, they just can't keep God's laws as they've been given to us. That old covenant, no matter what our background is, our age, our education, our circumstances in life, we have the same challenge. We're broken people who cannot savior ourselves. Now about 600 years before Jesus came to this earth, the Lord had the prophet Jeremiah give a wonderful word of hope to the people. The days are coming, he said in Jeremiah 31, when I will make a new covenant. I will put my law in your hearts and write it on your minds. I will forgive your wickedness and I will remember your sin no more. So God is going to make a new covenant for us. When the new Savior enters the scene, this is the beginning of a new era in the history of humanity. The new covenant he would establish is not based on us somehow trying to keep God's laws perfectly. Instead, God does everything. It's a covenant of grace. He forgives us and renews us literally from the inside out. Ever since Jeremiah wrote those words, and even before that, these people had been somewhat patiently waiting for God to come through on all of His promises. So when's that Savior finally going to come? When you read through chapter 22 of the story from the four Gospels this week, you learned that at just the right time, God sent His Son into the world. The wait is over. Now, what would it have been like for people that were alive at that time? What would it have been like if we had been back there? Well, here's the closest example I can come up with. When I grew up as a child in Iowa, there were no fireworks stands like this anywhere. In fact, fireworks were illegal, with the exception of sparklers and those, you know, those little tiny snake things you can light up. But I remember when I moved to Alaska about a decade ago, I was amazed at how many fireworks, in fact, I think they allowed anything short of nuclear weapons that you could literally blast off for yourself. You didn't have to go anywhere to see a special display. All you did was pull up a lawn chair out your back porch or out the front driveway and wait for the neighbors to start shooting them off. Now, some of their displays were actually better than the ones the city did. And the kids, oh my goodness, how they got so excited about the 4th of July, even though the sun didn't set till midnight. They would come up to me and say, hey, pastor, do you know what day it is? It's fireworks day! Woo! They just couldn't wait for the conditions to be right. Can we shoot the fireworks yet? Is it finally dark enough? Well, finally, as the kids were actually starting to fall asleep, because it'd be well after 10 before it even started to get dark, all of a sudden you hear a boom. And then the first fireworks had everyone looking for the big show. Then it was firework after firework. The fireworks lit up the somewhat dark night sky there in Alaska. Now, when Jesus enters the scene, he is the light. He comes into a broken world. Everything was radically changed when he arrived. Now, we did celebrate his arrival two months ago with Christmas, and we'll come back to the Christmas story, I promise, later this year. But this morning, I'd like to look at several things that are around the edges of the Christmas story. Chapter 22 of the story from this week not only talked about Jesus' birth, but also the wise men 
and then when Jesus, as a boy, went to the temple. Now, those both have a common theme. In fact, uh, there's a main issue that I'd like to focus on today. One of the myths that just drives me nuts is this. In order to be a Christian, you have to check your brain at the door. People will say, boy, if you believe in that stuff, you have to set your intellect to the side, and you're just taking a huge leap of faith. Now, not only is that or that cartoon up there false, but today we're going to see that faith and science work very well together. So let's consider the wise men first. Matthew 2 tells us of these men who came from the far east to Jerusalem, seeking the one who had been born king of the Jews. Now, around Christmas time, most of us, we're no different here, will grab our nativity set. When you look through the set, you'll find the baby Jesus, Mary and Joseph, maybe a few animals and some angels. What else do you usually find in that nativity set? The wise men. But the wise men weren't at the manger. They actually came later on. So uh, next year when you set up your nativity set, I hope I'm not stomping on toes here, maybe put them in the next room over perhaps? Just a thought. Now why would I tell you something like that? Matthew 2 verse 12, 11 tells us this, on coming to the house, not the manger, the stable, or the cave, they see baby Jesus with Mother Mary. They bow down and worship him. Now, according to tradition, there were three men. You know, we three kings of Orient are. We don't actually know how many there actually were. And you know what? It doesn't matter. Somewhere between when Jesus was eight days old and about two years old, they showed up at the house. Why do we think there are three of them? Well, because they brought gold, frankincense, and myrrh. Well, let's think about the three gifts for just a minute. Gold is a gift that's suitable for a king. Jesus is the king of kings. Frankincense is a gift suitable for a god. Jesus is God in the flesh. Myrrh, it's not really suitable for anything unless you person's just died and need to embalm a body. Now think about it. What did Jesus end up doing? Dying for you and for me. I think these three things actually simplify the story of Jesus for us. You see, he is the king of kings who's God in the flesh who died to bring us life. Gold, frankincense, and myrrh. Those three things can really simplify it for us. Now, how in the world did they know what to bring with them? Was it coincidence? No. I think it was only by the inspiration of God. So let's go back to these three really wise men for just a minute. All we know about them is that they were brilliant. They were the best of the best back in Jesus' day. The intellectual elites. They would have been the uh, MIT, Harvard, and Yale graduates of the day had the universities existed then. No one could dare self-identify as a magi back in the day. Even though today some would consider astrology to be a pseudoscience, back in that day, it was the cat's meow. So when the magi came to town, this was a big deal. The smart guys, the ones with the nosebleed high IQs, have just rolled into town. And when they arrived there in Jerusalem, Herod and all the teachers of the law told them, we are told that when the Savior of the world is to be born, he will be born in Bethlehem. So the men followed the star on, which was still in the sky, to Bethlehem. And then when they met Mary and Jesus in the house, they didn't just drop off some nice party gifts and sing happy birthday. The world's smartest guys took a knee, put their head in the dirt, and worshipped this infant as God. No matter how smart they were, they knew they needed something more. 
They worship the God who had come to forgive their sin. Now that is incredible. And let's think about this for a minute. Christianity is not anti-science. I actually really like this picture. It's not, well, if I'm going to be a scientist, I'd better ditch my faith. I insist that faith and science can be an incredible partnership. Science answers the what and the how. Faith, Christianity, answers the who and the why. They are both extremely important. In this congregation and in Sandpoint as a community at large, we have scientists who are in medicine, education, research. The things they do as God works through them bless our lives tremendously. But science alone cannot answer this question. What is the meaning of life? Science doesn't deal with how faith, forgiveness, and salvation affect my eternal spiritual existence with the Lord in heaven. You do need both. So scientists in that day came to Jesus and took a knee. And that still happens today. <clears throat> no matter how smart any of us gets, we all realize that one day we all will take a knee and humbly bow in worship before the Savior of the world. He is the only one <clears throat> who could possibly live, die on the cross to pay for our sin, and rise again to cleanse us from the inside out. That's exactly what Jesus talked about in Matthew 4, verse 4. Man does not live on bread alone, but on every word that comes from the mouth of God. We need both faith and science. It's all blessed by the Lord. And there's one other event that I'd very briefly like to consider in today's chapter, to the reading. At the end of Luke 2 is the only information we have in the Bible about when Jesus was a young boy. He's at the temple. Now, back in those days, the temple was where all the really smart folks, the philosophers, the teachers, the intellectuals just hung out. They would talk about the newest, greatest ideas of the day. The brightest of the bright were there every day. And Jesus is about 12 years old at the time. Now think of this. All the world's brightest people of the day are hanging out with Jesus and asking him questions. What's the meaning of life? What should I do? They kept pelting him with question after question because they are amazed by his answers. Basically, they're taking a knee before a 12-year-old. And that's actually what church, the collection of followers of Jesus, is about today. God meets you as we gather together with his word and his sacraments, baptism and the Lord's Supper. Through them, he fills you, he forgives you, he strengthens you for your daily journey of life and faith. He is leading you deeper and deeper in your walk of faith with Jesus. Now, as we work our way through the rest of the New Testament in the weeks ahead, it's my hope that this very first chapter, that chapter 22 in the story, builds a solid foundation for what is to come. No matter who you meet or how successful you may be in life, science and academics in life are, yes, crucial and vital. But in the end, we all need to take a knee before the Savior of the world. Because no one and nothing else will do. Why? Your Lord knew that you needed forgiveness. You needed life and freedom. The brokenness that entered the world through Adam and Eve all the way back in the garden was destroying lives for eternity. But God cared so deeply for you that he would do whatever it took to bring you back to him. That infant Jesus would grow to be a man who literally shared the good news of life and freedom. And even though he had committed no wrong, he willingly gave his life for you, arms stretched wide on the cross. That paid for your brokenness and for your sin in full. He rose from the dead, proving that Satan and hell 
They don't have the final say. As children of a loving Heavenly Father, you, through God's grace, have been given the forgiveness you need each day. In these next several weeks, as we go through a 40-day journey during the season of Lent and go with Jesus to the cross, we'll see just how powerful His love is for each one of us. It gave everything at such a high cost to keep you as His child forever. Let's all walk to that cross, but also the empty tomb where we celebrate that Jesus is alive together in these weeks ahead. In Jesus' name, amen. And now may the peace